But for early drivers, they were the latest in future technology. The first cars didn't even have steering wheels. They were operated like boats with tillers. Years passed before someone realized that using a steering wheel with a gear mechanism gave a car far more turning radius. It was simply one of those solutions that somebody tried, someone else improved upon. Ultimately, because it worked, everyone has followed and that now we are completely familiar with. As more and more women got behind the wheel, they demanded refinements that made the experience less rough and tumble and more appealing. People soon wanted cars that had solid roofs and were closed. They wanted things like roll-up windows. They wanted cars with heaters. They wanted cars that came in different colors. They wanted cars with doors. What human beings always want, it turns out, is more. Both men and women demanded a simpler way of starting the engine. Early gas-powered cars required the driver to prime the cylinders with gasoline, especially on cold mornings. Then the ignition switch could be turned on before using the crank to hopefully coax the engine to life. The effort required to do that was very high, so you had to be very strong just to physically start your, your car. And oftentimes when you tried to start the car, it was cold, it would backfire, which would force the crank backwards. And there were lots of broken arms in those days from trying to start a car. The crank handle was connected to the crankshaft, which, when turned, pulled the pistons downward. This caused the air and gas to be drawn into the cylinder. An electric trigger would then cause the spark, which ignited the mixture, and turned the engine over. In 1911, inventor Charles Kettering produced a small electric starter motor with enough torque to do the same job. Kettering was working for Cadillac, where his electric starter first became a standard feature before soon revolutionizing the entire industry. All a driver needed was the strength to put the ignition pedal to the middle. Suddenly the car becomes usable, um, practical, attractive to a much larger segment of the population. A lot of developments like that, step by step, made the car more appealing, more practical, more usable for more people. About the same time silent movies got sound, cars did too. In 1930, the Galvin brothers introduced the first commercially successful car radio, which they called the Motorola. It's probably why cars are so popular, because you could control the interior of your car so if you had a radio to entertain you, you could turn it on and listen to the news, listen to your favorite singer, listen to your favorite game, and uh, get a little bit of enjoyment while you were driving along. Ignition. We've come a long way since the introduction of the Motorola. Today, your car can receive satellite-carried programming and information from anywhere in the world, even in the remotest locations. GPS, or Global Positioning Satellite, are already a key element of onboard navigational displays. New networks called telematics are expanding drivers' interconnection with an array of services. Real-time information based on our exact location will tell us when we are approaching weather conditions that might affect our visibility or control, such as fog or wet roads. We will also expect to receive traffic information that will alert us to trouble ahead. If there's an accident or a bottleneck on one of the roads, the system will know where that is, and you'll literally be able to program your navigation system to route you from point A to point B in the fastest time, considering the traffic conditions that exist right now. These same systems can also signal a remote network of the car's location when stolen or in trouble, even put us in touch with a live operator. In the cars of the future, Electronics will continue to expand their role in all aspects of control in monitoring systems. Your car of the future might include conversational speech technology that allows you to speak naturally to control onboard systems. For example, watch what I can do with the instrument cluster. Show me digital gauges. Preferences. I'm cold. Turning up the temperature two degrees. Turn off the car voice. Preferences. Oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll be in the glove compartment if you need me. And you'll even be able to decide where you want different switches in your car. 
I know my wife uses the foam more than I do, so that will probably be the thing that gets closer to her. So inside here, I can imagine the foam would be there. For me, it'd probably be navigation because I'm topologically with the challenge and I'm lost all the time, right? So you can imagine that the switches would be presented differently. Today's cars contain as many as 30 microprocessors, optimizing virtually every key system in order to maximize performance and control. There's a lot of computing capability. Almost everything on a car is either controlled by a computer or monitored. The things that we can do electronically are just, just absolutely mind-boggling. They're, they're absolutely transparent to the majority of customers, which is the way we like it. For example, with electronic controls, when the accelerator is depressed, the fuel is delivered at an even and optimum rate for smoother acceleration and performance with minimum fuel waste. The engine and the ignition system and the fuel injection and then all the emissions controls are, are monitored by what we call an onboard diagnostic system, which is making sure everything on the car is working right. And if it isn't, it can actually make minor adjustments as a correction. This experimental GM car demonstrates the next generation of electronic controls called drive-by-wire. Drive-by-wire technology means the physical linkages between the driver and the device he or she wants to control are replaced by a computer. Instead of steering through a steering wheel and a steering shaft directly attached to the wheels, it's done like every aircraft in these days, done by wire. And the same with the brakes and every other interface between the driver and the vehicle. The control wiring is carried in a single harness and permits the driver to locate controls and instruments virtually anywhere in the wide open interior. No mechanical linkages, so it's very easy for us to slide the controls from the left side to the right side. So you'd be set up to drive in England or here, or maybe if somebody gets tired driving, you could just swap the controls over without having to get out of the car. No matter how smart cars get, they still won't guarantee you a free parking space. In Japan, Toyota is developing cars that actually park themselves. Through a rear-mounted camera, the driver chooses the coveted spot in the display. Then, the computer controls the steering and guides the car in. Self-parking cars may be the first step toward self-driving cars, at least in a controlled situation, like a freeway. The system will then check to see if his car's safe, and then it'll walk into a platoon of 10 or 15 cars that will be able to go very close together, maybe only 10 feet apart, travel at fairly high rates of speed. Uh, some suppositions are as high as 90 miles an hour. And the driver can stop driving. You can sit back and read your newspaper until you get to near your destination where the control of the car is turned back over to you and you pull out and drive to where you're going. Self-driving cars may be a good idea, considering the distractions from sophisticated entertainment options available now will probably only increase in the future. At Ford's full-motion-based driving simulator called Vertex, or Virtual Test Track Experiment, drivers are being analyzed to see just what kind of tasks they can safely do behind the wheel. Maintain the constant distance, watch for those events in the front, and watch for those events in the rear. So basically you've got five things to do that you're trying to pay attention to while we then ask you to do other things. What we're interested in looking at is the effects of some of the newer things that are being put into vehicles, the use of things like cell phone, navigation systems, information display systems that are going into vehicles. What's the effect on the distraction that they provide to drivers who are supposed to be paying attention to driving? The research found that hands-free cell phones were less distracting, but incoming calls were still a problem. In the future, the car may decide whether you should take the phone call. The vehicle is actually sensing what's going on around it, perhaps with cameras and things, and saying, okay, this is now a serious time. I mean, you, the driver should be paying attention. The vehicle makes the decision and won't let the phone work at that particular time. These are the types of things that might happen in the future. Drive-by-wire eliminates many mechanical elements and decreases the number of moving parts. It makes the vehicle weigh less, increases response, and reduces the need for vehicle servicing. Modern Marvel's car tech of the future will return on the History Channel. Since the beginning of the 20th century, twice as many Americans have been killed in auto accidents than in all of the wars America has ever fought. 
Automobile accidents uh, begin to happen pretty much as soon as there are automobiles. Anytime you've got people moving around in some kind of vehicle, eventually something unexpected and, and unfortunate is going to happen. The earliest cars might have looked harmless, but in reality, they were death traps. Early automobiles, by our modern standards, were extraordinarily unsafe. They were very high off the ground, which made them prone to roll over. Uh, typically, they only had brakes on the rear wheels. Uh, the brakes were awful. It used to be that uh, car companies didn't want to talk about safety. They thought, oh, that doesn't sell. Let's not remind consumers that they can get hurt in these things. Early improvements were simple ones. Lowering the car's center of gravity increased stability. Widening the wheelbase improved cornering and overall handling. At one time, accident victims were cut to shreds by shattered windshields. After researching the situation, engineers came up with a life-saving solution, safety glass. It's simply two sheets of glass adhered to a thin plastic layer in between them. And this has the purpose of, of holding the glass together instead of breaking into shards. The Swedish car company Volvo was a safety pioneer. In 1949, they installed some of the first safety belts in cars. By 1959, they advanced to three-point lap and shoulder belts, proving that buckling up for safety could make it possible for a crash victim to walk away. But to drivers in America, safety was still a dirty word. They used to always say to me in the press, you said, safety doesn't sell. I said, well, I didn't say it that way. I said, I can't sell it. <laughs> the people won't buy it. I was advertising, if you get in an accident, here's what we've done. We've padded the dash, we put in seat belts, nobody knew what the hell they were. Most people got them and sat on them and said, take them out. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to hook yourself in. They wouldn't do it. Seat belts were made mandatory features on all cars sold in America in 1967. Now they're more than an option. Their use is required by law. Today, the latest in seat belt design is the four-point system. Three-point belt is very good, but in certain circumstances, you can rotate out of the belt because you're not being held in on one shoulder. With a four-point, it's much like a racing car. You're held into the seat better. And it's not just for the driver. There is a rear seat rethink for the kids, too. What you'll see in the future are seats that are adjustable that bring the seat up and position the child so he can look out so he's comfortable in using the seat belt. Kids are killed only because they don't wear seat belts. The reason they don't wear seat belts is they're not comfortable and they can't see out of the car. So you'll see that kind of issue being addressed. The future of seat belt systems will include pretensioners tied to sensors that react to very hard braking or even vehicle collision detection. Warning. Pretensioners for the seat belts that sense the very onset of an impact and tighten the seat belts around you. And then even as your body is forced forward, relax their tension just a little bit so that the body isn't slammed into the seat belt. But there was an even bigger safety breakthrough hidden behind the wheels. One might think that in the last 50 years, the prime development to improve safety of automobiles was seat belts, but that's actually a close second. The, the prime uh, safety development has been four-wheel disc brakes with anti-lock. A disc brake includes a rotor and a caliper. The caliper closes against the rotor with applied force from one to four pistons, causing the wheel to stop spinning. The anti-lock braking system, or ABS, interprets the speed and force applied to the brakes and determines the severity of the situation. The computer then applies extra brake force if the driver's force is insufficient. Anti-lock braking systems prevent the wheels from locking up in an emergency stop situation, freeing you up. You just hit the brakes as hard as you can, and then you can still steer the car and have control of it rather than going into a skid. No safety device has received more praise or criticism from both consumers and car makers than the airbag. Research on the airbag began in the early 1970s. They didn't know what an airbag was. They said, Did a balloon blows up in your face, are you nuts? In the early days, there were a lot of concerns, with some justification, about how effective the bag would be. That is, would it go off when you needed it to? And is there a possibility it might go off in error? Since their inception, the technology behind the airbag has been greatly refined. They are truly an amazing piece of engineering. 
When sensors ascertain a collision force equal to running into a brick wall at 10 to 15 miles an hour, nitrogen gas is produced and fills the nylon airbag at a speed of up to 200 miles an hour and within 1 50th of a second of sensing the crash. When they worked and the engineers 